So we all know that we need some radical differences to occur in order to affect change. So why shouldn't art making be the space for that difference? It's possible to position artists to examine climate change or the impacts of global capital, yet the voice of an artist historically has stayed with their work. And in our times, we have created silos for our activities, whether those are creative, political, social, or related to entertainment, that are not always helpful. To effect change in this occasion, we have the possibility to use the unique space of the exhibition, which introduces art to its public, to a new set of exchanges. However, both of our subjects are still somehow missing the artist, and their potential audience. Uh, I think that the thing is that I think that art is a very interesting universal language, and it is something that can offer something to everybody, like nature can. And you can stick your head in the sand and not want to go there, but it is interesting if you endeavour. It's worth doing. Oh, absolutely. Art definitely has an advantage for having, for creating a, a set of open exchanges with an audience, especially um, when you're bringing in cross, fields that cross over with art and um, all of a sudden you've opened up these new avenues that you could not talk about in the original fields. Um, I think in terms of creating an open and direct exchange, Something, yeah, I have, to, I have to bring it back to the social context of art and um, how people prepare themselves to go to have an art experience. They might be consciously telling themselves as they enter the experience to, to be open or maybe um, they've done this so many times that it's become kind of a reflex. But I think that that's where a lot of the power lies. It's in um, the way that people... Um, it's in the ritual, I think. Yeah. The ritual of going to see art. Uh, the collective had the idea of bringing this upright piano into the, into the show. There were lots of conversations and I tried to draw on some of the uh, kind of artistic methodologies of the collective uh, and bring that into the, into the work. I think uh, music does have a special kind of um, probably I'd even call it advantage over um, a lot of purely visual arts and the fact that ultimately it's it's not representational um, so it means that um, the listener can come into the work the world can come into the work in a particular way that maybe uh, is not so possible in visual artworks is that I do think uh, in this day and age, artists do have a responsibility to say something or do something. And in every artwork, I do try to do something. It, um, you know, in terms of like how I might affect a viewer. Or, but as you say, um, you know, it comes back down to that thing. As on the other hand, uh, that art, the power of art lies in the fact that it doesn't have to um, say something specific or um, represent it. Um, uh, anything in a very literal way so the power of it uh, lies in the sense that it, it can be outside of um, those sort of final or total totalizing um, kind of senses of meaning you can you can bring a lot of things up but you do not have to fix yourself on one particular outcome or answer as such so um, yes I think art openness and connection and communication and prayer-like aesthetic qualities at times are really interesting but I don't know if they're, if they're interesting for you as the audience. I think the audience then needs to um, go to work on them and how that should happen is um, you know then takes us into paradigms of display and care and what a museum should be and what a gallery should be. I think, as you know, from the kinds of conversations we've been having, um, um, I love that space, but I also don't trust that space.
and um yeah all art is socialized in some way yet there are certainly lingering stereotypes of art's insularity that have separated art and artists thinking from what might be considered the center of things so when social and political pressures are intensified the certainly follows a questioning of art centrality, either personally or socially. When what we might call social urgency occurs, it's not always the case, however, that art's motivations change. Often the personal, habitual practice of making art is entrenched in daily life. But the point is, how do we want to encounter art and artists in our world? If you look, you know, in the New Zealand Herald, if you wanted to find about art, it's always under entertainment. But I'll never be satisfied with that. I actually think I'm changing the world. Um, I can have a really big influence on people and they can change their view. And people who never even knew that they liked um, Ray Shremmer and... Black Beatles and, you know, these songs that I'm putting on will suddenly realise that that was their favourite movie, music of their whole life and they've been missing art and that their life is, is not extended and they should try harder. The internet is, uh, you know, it's a world in its own, you know. I'm always constantly thinking about the digital and the physical spaces. Um, and I think it has, you know, there's a conversation between those two worlds in lo a lot of the work that I make. Um, and it has, yeah, def it definitely affects, you know. That's kind of why I like being outside, you know. I kind of like, you know, um, happy accidents, meeting new people, all those kinds of experiences, you know, and conversations. Um, I like that sort of, that, you know, real face-to-face -face connectivity with people. But then I also am quite interested or fascinated by the effect that a digital space um, has on people and how that has actually changed the way um, uh, we, I guess we communicate with each other as well. I've never seen the kind of political, socio-political scenario I want to see. It's always been a kind of disaster. And then my um, adult life, um, which has included a kind of social mobility, has totally been about making art and totally about being an artist. So I don't really know how to be in the world um, without this practice. So things aren't more urgent because they might be getting worse, but... Um, I've always felt a kind of urgency. The expectation for these 12-inch records was that they wouldn't be played because in a lot of cases there, there, was, there might have been some sound of wind or there might have been somebody walking past, but it wouldn't have been a sound that created any extra meaning above what you already knew, knew that this was the site where this thing happened or this was the place where you were standing. So there, that to me is Julian engaging very closely with the audience, whoever the audience might be, and asking them to take his place and stand where he stood. As much as I do think the idea of the artist not being this like uh, isolated genius has been dismantled somewhat, I do think that there is still a desire, I don't know if it's from artists or from the public, to like uh, preserve this narrative and... Um, for me, I guess I realised quite early on in my work that what was really important to dismantling that was not having any sense of, like, your ideas or your information being privatised, and so therefore you have to be really willing and really vulnerable to share and not feel like a kind of sovereign sense of uh, ownership of a particular ideas and content. And I'm not saying that means that, like, you can go out there and just suddenly start, like, stealing people's content. Writers are often asked, who did you have in mind when you wrote this story? In other words, who is your reader? But we seldom think of the artist imagining their audience. 
It's also important to remember that artists may not be remote from their audience in the phase of art making. They may not be squirreled away in their studio producing art in a moment of retreat. I'm always thinking, how does the moment of contact take place between an audience and a, and the uh, uh, face value of what is going to be experienced? Um, I don't... Um, in terms of, like, thinking about my audience kind of consciously as a figure or as a kind of social group um i don't really um i sort of try not to do that i try not to think about who my audience is going to how they're going to look and how they're going to sound and what group and what class and blah blah blah. i try to ignore those things i, I guess i fall back to that felix gonzalez Torres kind of mantra that you make work for an audience that doesn't exist yet but that you hope will occupy the museum after you're gone. With this work, I guess the, the kind of collaborative act was my real engagement with a person. So it was about the backwards and forwards um, between myself um, and the collective. And I think the work in a way embodies that in that it's a very open, kind of transparent work. Uh, it's not immediately clear what it does. The score is, is open. It doesn't lend itself to a particular kind of realisation. So I think some of that, the kind of openness to any voice is in the work. When I'm making artwork, when I begin a project, um, I guess it, it depends on the project itself. If someone's invited me to do something, then I think about the place where this work will end up um, and that audience, you know, already attached to it. So... Those are one of the considerations. Um, if I'm just sort of making things just because I want to, um, I'm not always thinking consciously about an audience. Um, but then sometimes I am, you know, I, I am thinking about an audience. I don't think you should always feel like I need to be so radical. Like I can just be quite subtle about what I'm trying to say. You know, I'm, I tried something new. I was trying something new. And is that okay? Like, is that okay? I think it's okay. Treating the gallery as a kind of lab, as a kind of test space for these ideas to happen seems kind of, it needs to be more than a lab. It needs to be a space of, you know, radical change or something like that.